Hi, I'm Althea Brooks. I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. Thank you for joining us for this inaugural Parent and Family Read and Virtual Book Discussion, held in partnership with UVA's Division of Student Affairs. Today's discussion is based on the book, Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less by Professor Lydie Klotz from the Architecture and Engineering Schools. We appreciate Tabitha Enoch from the UVA's Division of Student Affairs for joining us today. She will moderate this conversation and I'll introduce her shortly. Should you have a question during this program, kindly enter it into the, into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're recording this evening's uh, event and we'll post it in the Lifetime Learning's website uh, in our podcast library. Visit engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. The video will be there in a couple of weeks. Now allow me to briefly introduce our moderator for this conversation. Tabitha Anak is Associate Dean in the Division of Student Affairs at the University of Virginia. In 1999, Tabitha assumed the position of Assistant Dean in Residence Life at UVA. In 2002, her responsibility shifted from residence life to orientation and new student programs. The orientation program provides incoming students with services that enable them to transition smoothly into student life at UVA. In addition to orientation and new student programs, Tabitha helps to shape the diversity and inclusion efforts of student affairs division. She supports UVA's first generation, low-income students, and undergraduate student veterans. In 2019, Tabitha became Associate Dean of Students in the Office of the Dean of Students. Tabitha oversees Summer Orientation, Wahoo Welcome, Opening Convocation and Honor Induction, Grounds for Discussion, which is a peer theater production, Transfer Students Programming, and Family Weekend. In a nutshell, Tabitha and her team, they work to build an inclusive and welcoming experience for new undergraduates. Now, I'd like to share just a few little tidbits about Tabitha you might not know. She's often called the university's unofficial hype girl. You'll have to ask her what that means. I won't develop. <laughs> also, she's uh, final exercises DJ. Who knew? Tabitha. Welcome and uh, take the microphone on and uh, enjoy the program and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Althea. I appreciate that kind introduction and very uh, generous introduction. I'm so excited to, I hope that there are so many first year parents and um, families out there today that I met during summer orientation. I know that this program is open to all families of UVA students and alumni and such, but a special shout out to my first year families and to uh, parents of transfer students. As Althea said, I am Tab Enoch. I am the university's unofficial hype girl. I do not have music for y'all tonight because I want to get straight to the substance, but I hope that your students' introduction in first six weeks of um, at UVA has been um, really transformative for them. I hope it's been as fun as it probably is challenging. And so the only thing I'll share to families out there is that please, regardless of what has happened over these last six weeks, know that the transition for new students is certainly probably a 12 to 24 month experience. So they're in their first six weeks. I hope it has gone well. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker for y'all tonight, because I think what the author has to share and what our faculty member has to share can be helpful and instrumental in the lives of students. So I would I am honored to introduce Lydie Klotz, who is our guest speaker today. And Lydie is joined by a special assistant who I am sure will introduce himself to the crowd as well. Um, but a little bit about our speaker for tonight. Um, he studies the science of design, which he reminds us is something that we all do every day. His research has appeared in both Nature and Science, and he is a frequent guest on interview programs, including Hidden Brain, 
So for you podcasters out there, get on that Hidden Brain one. That's a really good one. Freakonomics, NPR, and for The Atlantic. His writing has appeared in outlets such as The Washington Post, Fast Company, Harvard Business Review, and Scientific American. He is a sought-after speaker, having given more than 100 invited talks at leading universities, think tanks, and companies. Now a professor at the university, Lighty has authored more than 80 original research articles. Now, here's the interesting stuff for me. Um, before becoming a professor, he designed schools in New Jersey. And so y'all know I always give a shout out to my people. I'm not from New Jersey. I'm from Boston, but I give a shout out to my people in Jersey. Because remember, during summer orientation, I played that Journey song. So y'all remember. And before he did that, he played as a professional soccer player. So Lighty, we are delighted to have you today. Um, I would love for you to, you know, introduce yourself to the crowd here and also introduce us to that young man standing behind you. Awesome. Oh, thanks so much, Tab. And thank you all for, for being here. Um, it's funny, I'm, I, uh, I'm working on my next book now and uh, I was writing today a section about basically how much I love seeing students over that first kind mm. of six weeks or our first semester. I don't think there's a bigger time for growth. Um, and uh, as Tab said, it's a longer process than just the first six weeks, but boy, does a lot happen in that time. And I just think it's, you know, something that I've had the pleasure of seeing with Ezra, who's the gentleman next to me, where where they figure out that they can do something and then they go do it. And uh, just the opportunities to do that at college are amazing. So thanks for being here, but also thanks so much for for sharing your your loved ones with us. I mean, that's the other thing is I've gotten him to he's nine years old in two days, but um, I know how much uh, how much fun work has gone into that. Um, and I can't imagine how much it takes to get the kid to college and then to get them to a college like UVA. So congratulations, but also thanks for sharing them. And I mean, Tav mentioned all those things that I do. My favorite part of the job is is mm -hmm. working with your your wonderful kids. And that's, that's why I'm at UVA, quite frankly, is because of the the caliber of the, the kids that we get here, not just academically, but uh, in character and, and all the other things that make them great. Um, so Ezra wasn't actually here to illustrate that story, even though he does illustrate it well. Um, the whole, I'm, I'm going to give a little overview of the research, just so we're all on the same page and the idea behind subtraction. And it, and it all started like six years ago, I was playing Legos with Ezra and we had this. Um, this is the civil engineering part of the presentation. So what you can see here is this is not a level bridge. Um, and this is something that I went to fix, right? And I'm a, a professor. Uh, I said, I'm an a engineer by training. I'm going to add a block to this to this short column. I Before I could do that, I turned back around and my three-year-old at the time had removed a block from the longer column. And it's a, a true story. I've told it so many times people will say, oh, this is, that's a cool apocryphal story. And then I had to look up what apocryphal means. And it, that means that it's not actually true. And no, this is true. This actually happened. And Ezra figured out this, this way to subtract. And it illustrates um, what a lot of research has since confirmed, basically what happens, which is that we we have something that we want to make better. In this case, it was something relatively trivial, just a, a Lego bridge. Um, but it also applies to our writing, to our schedules, to how we're parenting. Um, something that we want to make better. And our first thought is, hey, what can I add to make this thing better? Um, and then we move on without even considering whether subtracting might have been a better option. Um, and that's something that, you know, knowing that, is really powerful because we can then understand why we might do that and understand what we might do about that. So I just wanted to give a basic overview so we're all on, on the same page. Um, and then we're going to have ample time for discussion and we're even going to play a, uh, a subtracting game at the end. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Ez. Ezra might come back for the questions. Uh, depends on depends on his video watching. So I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So normally I, I use a slide to tell the story of Ezra. You guys got the full experience. Um, now I'm a researcher, right? So we can't just do one uh, story from our kid playing with Legos and then write a paper about it. Um, we have to do studies. And 
we did a lot of studies, okay? And the, the goal is not to memorize this. The goal is just to show, hey, we looked at this in a lot of different ways. And I think when we're thinking about subtracting as a way to improve things, it's useful to think across physical things like those block structures, like your your houses, uh, your offices, but also social things, activities, and also ideas, right? And I think those are the three basic categories. We studied this in a lot of different ways and people were adding uh, in all of those contexts. One that was surprising to me, for example, we, we, um, we gave people summaries of writing and the, when people received the summaries of the writing and were asked to make them better, by and large, they made them better by adding more words to them, um, which, you know, the, the, the most assigned book on syllabi in high school and college is Strunk and White, right? And their classic advice is to omit needless words. I guarantee you, uh, your first years are learning that right now. Um, and yet it's, it's hard advice to, to take um, that that omitting needless words can actually make our writing better. The pre-filled day trip itinerary, this was a study we gave people where here on a drag and drop interface is a day that you're going to spend in Washington, DC, right? And a single day had them seeing 14 different, doing 14 different big things like visit the Smithsonian, go to the Lincoln Memorial, eat lunch at a five-star bistro. Those of you who are from the DC area, there were two and a half hours of traffic of, of travel time just between the activities, not to mention, you know, there's never ideal traffic in DC, right? So it's an impossible day trip, basically. And to make it better, people tended to add more things onto it. Um, so again, what we're seeing here is this tendency when we think of some, when we try to make something better, our instinct is to add. Um, we have a study from University of Virginia, and I understand one of the people on the picture is going to be talking at a, at a later event, but um, this, when President Ryan came in before the pandemic, he said, you know, we need to do a strategic plan, help us kind of craft our, our vision for the university, I'll be working in the same direction. And it's a great strategic planning activity, got, ex got um, suggestions from all sorts of people. So students, faculty, alumni, parents, um, everybody was involved in the strategic planning, you could suggest ideas on this web interface. There were 581 ideas that suggested adding things um, and 70 ideas that suggested removing something. Now, I have nothing bad to say about the additions, right? Um, you can go through all of them and say, okay, maybe we need all of these things. But when you're brainstorming ideas and you have 581 of one type and only 70 of another type, it suggests that you're kind of systematically missing out on opportunities to make something better because who knows what wasn't suggested that could be considered that could actually make our university better all right so the the last study i want to show you, you this was posted in the in the washington post or reproduced in the washington post what you could do if you wanted to criticize all the things that i just said is say well yeah that makes sense lighty right uh we add with legos because we've learned to add with Legos. That's what we've been doing our whole lives. Or we add to the DC itinerary because we really want to have more activities. We add to the writing because maybe that does make a better summary. Maybe UVA did need 581 things and only 70 things subtracted. There's no kind of concrete proof that people are adding even though it's the wrong answer or even though it's the thing that they don't actually want to do. Um, so the symmetry puzzle, as you can read, what's the simplest way to make this symmetrical from left to right and top to bottom? And since you've had the first part of the presentation, you know the simplest way is to remove the blue blocks from the upper left corner there, right? Um, what most people do is jump right to adding blocks to the three corners. Um, to make it symmetrical, which takes more time, takes more clicks, is not is most certainly not the simplest way. Um, and so this is evidence that people are thinking of adding first, following through with adding, and then making it, and then this is making it so that they're missing out on opportunities. Now this, uh, I just need to brag about this. This is like the highlight of my academic career. It's something that hardly any faculty get to experience and I'm sure I'll never experience again. So it's on the cover of the top uh, academic journal nature um, and the title is less is more but the subtitle is what we got to write which is that why subtractive changes require 
more thought. And that is one takeaway here, right? It's not that we can't think of subtraction. It's just that it's not our first thought. And knowing that we can take steps to, to use this way of solving problems more often. Um, while we were writing the paper, I was writing this book. Um, and one of the great things about writing a book for a, a broader audience is that you get to kind of speculate on the reasons for the new finding, but also the, the ramifications, right? What can we do about this? Um, and so I'd like to take you through some of the reasons that have practical implications and some of the things that we can do about it really quickly before we get to the questions. So anytime you discover like a behavior, right? Or a, a something in our brain where we're kind of wired to, to think in a certain way, we can, there are multiple reasons for why this is happening, right? It's not just our evolution or it's not just uh, our culture. It's not just uh, socioeconomic factors, but it's a combination of all those things. And a good first one to look at is kind of, well, what about this behavior might've been helpful in having us pass our genes down? or pass our genes along over generations. Um, and one thing that I encountered here when I was looking into that was this notion of competence or showing an ability to effectively interact with the world. And the classic example of this is the bowerbirds. And in the picture here, you can see the male bowerbird and these male bowerbirds go build the ceremonial nests that you see in the background and even decorate them. And then the female bowerbirds go and look at all the nests that the males have built and then they decide which male to mate with based on which nest they like best, which all sort of makes sense so far. Um, but then the female goes and builds a nest to actually shelter the young, to raise and shelter the young. So there was no shelter function of the nest that the, the male built. It was simply to show that this male bowerbird could effectively interact with the, with the world around it, right? And so... And the reason for that is, okay, if this male bird can move sticks around, then it's more likely that the offspring will be able to move sticks around, which will be helpful if they're building nests or helpful if they're looking for food. And I mean, women love this example because the male is the one kind of wasting their energy. But this, this idea of displaying competence is something that extends uh, across multiple kinds of animals, including humans and across genders. Um, and this displaying competence, uh, which the Bowerbird example is displaying competence in the physical world also extends to the to the social world, right? So if I look at a lot of the reasons that I fail to subtract in my life, I think it's it's a, this desire to display competence. I know that there, I subtracted a lot of words from subtract the book, but there are certainly words that are remained or, or passages that remained that it's like, you know, it was, it was hard to take them out because, Hey, I did this. I want somebody to see it. Um, and so when you're editing your writing or when you're deciding which meetings to go to, or you're, you're trying to display competence or you're fighting against this urge to display competence. And of course, the reason that's a problem for subtraction, right. Is because when you add, you, you display competence, right. Your addition is in the world there's evidence of it for people to see. You can be competent by taking something away, but if the subtracted words from my book are out of sight, out of mind, there's no evidence that that they ever existed. And I'm not able to display competence from those subtracted words. So so that's one of the, the biological reasons to keep in mind. And we'll talk about ways to kind of overcome that tendency to be able to subtract more. Um, another engineering example, but I think if you look at reasons for behavior, there's biological reasons, there are also cultural reasons, right? And um, culture evolves in the same way as as biology, but it, it moves much more quickly through ideas. I think the punchline with cultural reasons for addition is that for a long time, it's just been, it may have been a better way to make change adding, right? And so this is one of the first roads and when there are two civilizations that aren't connected by a road, it makes sense to build a road, right? To connect them. And it's only now when we've got built up cities with roads bisecting neighborhoods that it makes sense to say, hey, you know, maybe this city would be better off if this, you know, highway was removed, right? So that's a relatively new decision that we have to make, even with 
you know, University of Virginia as a as an organization, right? Um, when it was first starting, they were probably adding things was probably more often than not the right way to make changes, more professors, more majors, more subjects. And now that we have a big university, there are some other options for for taking things away to make the university better. So those are the cultural reasons. I mean, I think the the socioeconomic ones are often are the first ones that people bring up, right? So I'll, I'll do my presentation and people say, well, this is just because of capitalism. Or this is just because this is the way the economy works or how we're incentivized. And I think we should look at what those incentives are, but I think that those incentives are often much more uh, symptom than a root cause of uh, our kind of tendency to add and, and not subtract. All right. So what do we do about it? Okay. Um, and I think the core problem here, I, I added this slide because I often give the presentation and people say, well, what's the, why, why is this happening? I just, I, I just told you everything I know about why it's happening. And I think what they want me to do is speculate a little and not, uh, you know, go away from what's grounded in the research. And so I think this is what's happening. Um, I could never prove it. Nobody could, but the, there's this, cycle right where we add more right so we think of it more we choose it more we make more additions we put those additions out into the world and then out in the world those additions are visible so we move around in a world with evidence of the additions which are you know physical social ideas and then that reminds us to add more that primes us to add more and this cycle goes and that's how we keep adding things um, and are become less likely to subtract. So that's my theory about it. So now we can get to what to do about it. Um, I think uh, Bruce Springsteen's a great example. We've already been talking about New Jersey a little. So here's some more for the people from New Jersey. Um, Bruce is my one of my favorite musicians. Well, definitely my favorite musician. And um, if you're not a Springsteen fan, I'll give a brief overview of his album, Darkness on the Edge of Town. So he put this out after... Um, born to run so he's a rock star already he's famous this is his fourth album and in between releasing born to run and when he released darkness he was in a dispute with his management company so he couldn't release any music and he wrote between 50 and 100 songs during this time and he's giving songs away because they weren't good enough for the album and not just giving songs away but giving really good songs away so he gave away during this time fire to um the pointer sisters this little girl to gary u.s bonds um be, uh, I, yeah, Because the Night to, to Patti Smith, all three of those songs charted higher than any song he had ever released to that point in his career. So he's giving away songs. Um, and then if you look at the songs themselves that make it onto Darkness, they're stripped down. The instrumentals are stripped down, especially compared to his earlier albums. And the lyrics are stripped down. So I didn't do this on my professor time, but I, uh, I went through and counted the words per song on his first few albums versus this album. And there are about 100 fewer words per song on Darkness on the Edge of Town. So the lyrics are stripped down. And he puts this album out into the world. And, you know, you can think what you want about Springsteen. I know people have different tastes in music. But any self-respecting list of the top albums of all time in Darkness on the Edge of Town is on it, right? There's no question that this is different and that this is what he was going for. And it's a massive act of subtraction, but nobody said, oh, Springsteen couldn't think of more lyrics or he couldn't think of more instrumentals or he couldn't think of more songs. It was, hey, Springsteen was going for this stripped down aesthetic and there, therefore the subtraction that he did do kind of showed competence and i think you can see this in in apple products right nobody says oh steve jobs couldn't think of another button for the iphone it's like no this was this was the intent and the people that you can think of who have really like streamlined schedules or really have their act together in terms of their productivity you, you realize that their their effortless um kind of schedule is a result of uh subtracting intentionally not just uh kind of stumbling into it or not just being lazy so i think if we subtract enough we can show competence um and i think this is a good way to think about it right if you kind of progress through these stages of good better and then less which is equating to even better than better right um but you've got to go through it sequentially you've got to do this mentally right um we can think of subtraction it just takes more thoughts and you've got to do it 
physically too, right? I mean, to to take words away to make a better summary, you have to have added the words in the first place. So it's by definition, more work, right? You've got to add the words, take them away, and then you've got this, this better product. And that's the kind of subtraction that we're after. It's fun work, but it's it's not lazy less, right? It's not just not doing anything. Um, and we need to recognize that to be able to have, um, you know, to be able to follow through with it. So I need to end on this slide. Um, one criticism that I get from my wife about this work is that Josephine isn't in the book enough. She's uh, It's dedicated to her, but She's not in the book because she wasn't alive when I was writing the book, but she's four and a half now. And I can use her to illustrate one of my favorite examples of subtraction from the book. And that's the balance bike that she's on top of. And I imagine most of you, if you've got first years, you probably are familiar with the balance bike, um, which this is a, a bike that is, doesn't have pedals and doesn't have the drivetrain. And what that means, and it's a scaled down version of a bike, obviously. So as soon as Josephine could, could toddle, she could walk on top of this bike, right? And then she did that for about an hour and eventually, you know, very quickly was able to propel herself like a Flintstone vehicle on top of this bike. Now she can ride it as fast as I can, as fast as I can run, but she doesn't need to ride it because she's already moved on to her big kid bike. And when, when kids move the balance bike to the big kid bike, they don't need training wheels because they already know how to balance. Right. So, um, it's just this amazing invention. It's brought, uh, bike ride to bike riding years to, to kids life. You see Josie's the look on her face there, right? I mean, that, that look of accomplishment and freedom, it's amazing. Um, and it's a very marketable invention, right? Uh, you can sell this to kids and, and their parents. Um, and if you think about all the in innovation that went on in bikes over the last 100 years, right? Fatter tubes, fatter tires, more gears, all the accessories, some of which Josephine has on her bike. It took a remarkably long time for somebody to say, hey, I can subtract the drivetrain and the pedals and make this amazing product. So I'd like to leave it there with Josephine and bring Tab back in to, to ask questions and have a bit of a conversation. And we'll do that for a while. And then we'll move into the subtracting game where hopefully you'll kind of put some of these ideas into practice. And I've told Tab this, but I also would tell the audience this. I mean, nothing's off limits. I love talking That's about fine. this. And I get amazing. One of the surprising things about this, because um, the book has, and the, this idea has allowed me to have a lot of amazing conversations I, I always saw that as, you know, I think what a professor does is fundamentally create and share knowledge. Um, and this is, I always bucket it as part of the sharing knowledge, right? It's like, okay, this is, I'm going to share the ideas that I came up with. But there's also a huge amount of creation that happens here because there's a feedback loop where I talk to people and I get ideas for the next research. So please don't hold any ideas back. Um, and I really uh, treasure anything that anybody has to offer. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lighty, um, for that. And at this juncture, we are opening up, opening, opening up the session to any Q and A that you might have. So please feel free to add some questions in the chat, um, so that we can get as many questions as we can before we jump into the activity portion. Don't be shy, um, Lighty. I have to tell you that picture of Bruce Springsteen is when he was young. I remember him, and then when you were mentioning the point of sisters, I was like, oh, you're speaking my language there. So um, thank you for that little ride down memory lane. But as the folks on the call get warmed up, I mean, I guess the opening question that I would have for you as folks start to ask their questions is, um, you talked a little bit about how we can implement this into our lives. I'm just curious about, do you have like any, uh, some, some real world examples of how people might be able to subtract in a real world example in their real everyday life. So uh, you talked about yeah. adding and then taking it back and adding and taking it back. How does that play itself out in the real world? Yeah, I think, I mean, conceptually, we can think about this in two stages, right? And it's a simplification, but it's helpful. And first, you need to think of subtraction, and then you need to follow through with it. Um, mm -hmm. And on the thinking of it part, you know, giving ourselves reminders um, is incredibly helpful. Uh 
And the nice thing about the reminders is that the right kind can also help with the following through, right? So I'll give a very simple example. Um, I, like everybody, you know, have my list of to do's. And if I'm being disciplined that week, I will think about what, what are my to do's for the week. But now I, I force myself when I'm coming up with my to do's to also come up with, okay, what should I stop doing, right? Which makes sense when you mm. think about it, because if I'm going to try all these new things, I need to get some things off my plate. But that that simple process forces me to at least keep my own personal activities for the week in process in in balance. So now I've got a reminder to think of subtraction, but I've also given myself a little bit of leeway to actually follow through with it because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I told myself I'm supposed to use stop doings. And I think you can imagine scaled up versions of that. I mean, I think the workplace is something that people think of often where Okay, um, if somebody suggests a new process or policy or procedure um, in the workplace, fine, that's great. It might be amazing. We should talk about it. But also, when you suggest the new thing to add, suggest two things that we're already doing that we could take away, right? So the policies or procedures or rules or regulations that are already on the books that we mm -hmm. should discuss removing. And it's the same exact thing. It, it helps you think of it, right? Helps overcome the thinking barrier but it also just gives you permission to do it. And um, I also think uh, I'll give one parenting one since that's uh, on everybody's mind, right? It's like when your kid does some new amazing thing, like, okay, Ezra has figured out how to, um, well, I don't know. I just said Josie has learned how to ride her pedal bike, right? So that's a cool milestone, this thing that she has added use those milestones as an opportunity to think of things that you can stop doing for them, right? It's like, okay, mm. she's grown, she can ride her pedal bike, maybe she can also, um, or maybe I don't need to carry her dishes to the, to the counter or to the sink anymore, even though I still do that. But, um, <laughs> so, but now, now I've got myself thinking, but yeah, it's just, again, it's an example of, okay, cool life milestone. I'm super proud of my kid. Is there something that I'm doing for them that I could take away and help them grow even more. So the common theme in all of those things is that you're kind of making it part of your process, right? You're not relying on it in the moment to have this moment of inspiration about subtraction and you're building it into your process and you're giving yourself permission to do it. Okay. So thank you for that. And I see a lot of questions coming in, in the chat. And so Lighty, well, we're going to, you know, walk through some of them, some of them here that I see. Um, since all of us are, um, uh, all of the folks on the call primarily are parents of college students, I'm going to start with the second question, which is, can you talk about what subtraction looks like for college students? Yeah, it's a tough one. And it's a great opportunity for me to say that addition is amazing, right? If I had to choose between addition and subtraction, I would probably choose addition. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is not to say don't go join clubs, don't explore opportunities, don't have new friends. I think the the lesson for college students probably and is to, okay, what is what is your goal, right? What is your vision? And I know, you know, I don't think that this is a time in life where you should be so rigid that you have, you know, I'm definitely going to medical school and that's the only possible thing I'm focused on right now. Um, although that's totally fine if you are. But what I'm saying is that's a way to kind of filter the subtractions and the additions um, out, right? Because I do see a lot of students here. We have amazing students and one mm -hmm. way that they kind of compete is to see who can collect the most minors, for example. And there's right. nothing wrong with minors. Um, I, you know, again, for some kids, it's appropriate, students, it's appropriate to have five different minors, but sometimes it feels like they're just kind of, you know, filling up their, their list of accomplishments instead of actually thinking about what they want to get out of this precious time here. And there's an, there's an opportunity cost, right? Because when you say yes to something, you're basically saying no to every other single thing. Um, and so I think for students, the key is, you know, what, what is it that you're really trying to get out of school and that can change. Um, and is the, the way that you're spending your time helping with that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that's a useful exercise for them to engage in. It's one of the things that they can learn. I'm, you know, I'm certainly still learning that with my own time, but I think that's a way that it can be helpful. Do you have ideas? I mean, you see a lot of these students too. Um, yeah, yes. When you were talking about the majors and the minors thing, I mean, I hear a lot of students double majoring and then minoring. And um, sometimes I think there's a pressure, unintended consequence that every student then thinks that that's the path. 
And mm-hmm. so I remember one of the deans in the school said, you know, if you really do have an interest in both things, then do that, right? Like if you right. can't really make a decision, then do that because maybe art history activates a particular side of your mind where, you know, the math might, you know, offer something or there might be something that are really similar and you can't make a decision. So in that way, do it. But if you're doing it for the point of more is better, then I think that is the time to think about, um, consider, you know, why am I, why am I double majoring in a particular thing or yeah, joining I, all the clubs? You know, how can I be meaningfully engaged versus engaged in all these things? Right. And I think, you know, Hey, so my vision is that I want to develop my leadership skills, right? So, okay. Don't join 10 clubs, join one and be and like, work up to be a leader in that one club. Right. That's and, right. And, yeah. And I will also say that being on the other end of this, and I, I mean, I talk to a lot of fourth year students and see them go out in the world. I mean, you're at UVA. One of the benefits right. is that you're going to have your pick of jobs, right? I've never seen a student not get a job because they only have one major <laughs> or like <laughs> not take their first step. And then after they have the first job, it's like, nobody's even, nobody cares what you're Nobody asks. Is for, right? right. And so nobody asks. It just gives, you know, a little bit of permission. I also, I mean, I hire graduate students and these are some of the highest achieving academically, at least. Um, And I would much rather see a student who has, you know, a single major and played a sport or a single major was in the marching band or like did, uh, did really well at two things. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not counting. I'm I'm looking at quality. Um, And so, yeah. And so how then can our families um, nudge the students in that direction, right? Like, because they're going to be like, want, 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 you know, how can, what might be some language that a parent could use to sort of nudge the student to at least interrogate the why? Yeah, you got to maybe share back with me any tips that the parents figure out. My sense is that a lot of the students are doing it for the exact, they they just think that it's the right thing to do and they're hearing it from their peers and their peers are influential and then they get into this yeah. kind of competing in this false way. And so I think just helping them break through that. Um, I know I'm in a better position as a professor than as a parent to do that, right? Because they'll act, they may actually listen to me, but I do. The first thing I say is, look, you know, this doesn't matter as much as you think it, you know, it well, you know, take a step back. First, ask, why are you doing this? Right. That's right. And then, you know, first and foremost, most of the time they will say like, well, I'm doing this, you know, just because I want to, it's like fear of missing out. Right. And it's not, there's no kind of grand plan. And then I just kind of help them understand that, you know, most, most employers when looking at a resume, aren't even looking at your minors, nevertheless, how many you have. Right. And you can basically, you can effectively show the same thing to an employer by saying, here are the three classes I took in psychology. And that shows that I have an interest in it just as much as a psychology minor, because they're not even looking at, at that kind of thing. Um, so I, I help students kind of understand it in that way. I think that might be something that a parent could do. And maybe, you know, since they're not going to listen to you because you're their parents or they're only going to listen to a certain amount, you could uh, have other people who are employers or mm-hmm. in positions that the students care about, you know, or think they care about impressing when they get out of school kind of help reassure them. Or you can send them to me. I like talking to students. Yeah, I'll, send I'll, them to Lighty. Send them to yeah. Professor Lighty. Okay, and so, it's a delicate, I mean, I do think, you know, as long as they're not watching TV and playing video games the whole time, I mean, all right. these things are great things, right? You're not missing out too much if you join an extra club or you take an extra minor. That's not a, a huge problem, um, but it's it's something we can help them with. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so as a professor, here's a question that I have for you that has come in for, into into the chat which is, so what do you think of the college assignment when asked to write X number of words or a minimum or maximum number of words? Is that, how does that fly in, in sort of the subtraction mindset? Oh, I this is something I'm very proud of in my own teaching that I've like taken the subtraction mindset to heart where, um, I, yeah, so I, I thought about this and I'm like, oh, geez, yeah, we're incentivizing this. So I've got a couple of stories. One is how I try to do it in my classes. I'll have, okay, 10 page paper due halfway through the semester. And of course, now they're all writing that with chat GPT. So we've got to figure that (laughs) out. But um, and so 10 page paper due halfway through the semester. And then same topic, 
five page paper due like a couple weeks before the semester ends. And then you're boiling it down to like two pages or even a oh, post okay. in an abstract at the end. So you're kind of forcing them to go through this yeah. good, better, less process, right? And, and incentivizing it. And what I think is nice about that and is important and we can do it in an educational setting is that it it shows that we know that this takes more time and that we expect iterations, right? I mean, one stark difference that I had between my undergrad experience where you kind of just write something and give it to your professor and that was the end of it, right? And that's not how the world works. It's like the world, you you do something, somebody gives you advice and then you do it again, right? And you make it better and better and better that way. And I think trying to help them see that is is one way we can do that but yeah we we certainly do this in academia what i was laughing because one story that made it into the book one of my favorite ever uva students was this uh woman named courtney and um, i'm sure she's a successful architect somewhere now but um so she took a class with me and we i talked about some of these topics and she's like oh i have a great example for you i just applied um to uh harvard and mm -hmm. their architect, their design school. And there was a, a question on there that had the word limit, um, which was, you know, funny enough. It's like, okay, this has to be 250 words. That was a suggested amount. Not only that though, but the question was, what is your reaction to the aphorism less is more? So it's a question about <laughs> attraction and there's the word limit right after it. And so like suggesting that Courtney needs to write 250 words about it. And I was so proud of her. She wrote a haiku. Um, oh, and, good for her. Yeah, it got reprinted in the, so her haiku is in the book, but then uh, new, when New York Review of Books wrote about this book, which is like a prestigious, like literary thing, um, they pulled the haiku out and put that in. So Courtney's haiku got published in New York Review of Books. But um, yeah, I think that's uh, and some cool stories. I think it's totally true that we incentive, you know, we, we, have to be careful what structures we put in place because if you ask for 12 pages you're suggesting that that's the measure of right. how good this is um and even just how you frame it makes a difference right because you say it has to be at least 12 pages that's different than saying it can be no more than 12 pages um, mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. writing's a fun one well one last one more question before we go into the activity um and I'm trying to I'm gonna synthesize the question here but one of the the heart of the question is you know how do we subtract when it all feels essential Th this person is asking specifically as a part of a job description as she's been working in her field for many many years the responsibilities have grown and it makes it difficult right to subtract stuff when it all feels so valuable and essential and so in the work setting, do you have any, can you offer anything about how do we subtract when it all feels essential? Yeah, I I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, first thing I can do is empathize. And I think, you know, the more important something is, the more, you know, value you assign to it, the harder it is to subtract. Um, and I think, uh, but practically, I mean, in the work environment, one suggestion that I've seen that's really interesting is in annual reviews, just having people say, okay, here are the things that I've been doing that I am not going to do to help, uh, to help carve space for the new things that I want to do. So it's not exactly mm -hmm. like dealing with the position description, but it would, you know, year over year, it would kind of help you give you freedom to go to your supervisor and say, no, look, I'm supposed to suggest these things in my annual review. Here's mm -hmm. something that I'm doing that, you know, it's valuable, but it's, it's the least valuable thing I'm doing. And I would like to be able to replace that time with, with something else. So it's hard, but it's, um, you know, I think again, going back to building it into the process and giving yourself some, some flexibility to do it. Um, and also just, you know, yeah, ruthlessly, ruthlessly prioritizing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also a reminder, right? Because who, I think most of us are in situations where there are certain things that we have the authority to take off our own plate and there are certain things that we don't, right? And we're right. also in situations where we can give people working with us flexibility to take things off the plate or not. And so if you're if you're the if you're the supervisor, <laughs> maybe That's be right. helping people. I talked to uh, another UVA grad actually and she works at she's a VP at Capital One now and she She's like, she goes to her teams and says, hey, what can I help you take off your plate? And that's a really mm -hmm. simple thing, but it's forcing them to, it's helping them think of this other way that they can make their lives better. 
If every manager did that, if every manager did that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you a minute so that you can set up for our engagement piece, our activity. I see that there are other questions in the chat. My understanding is what Lydie is going to show us might elicit some additional questions. So we may not get to all of the questions um, that are in the chat. I'm going to go through them while you set it up, Lydie, and see if there's any all quick right. ones. Here it's going. Yeah, we'll keep doing the questions. I just wanted to share this. I mean, I think this is a really practical way to put some of these ideas into action. Um, so it's just called the subtracting game. Uh, and you can think about this in terms of activities, mindsets, and physical things, right? And also think about it in terms of what specific subtractions would make your work life even better. So this is, you know, get rid of X meeting or get rid of X approval process or whatever task. Or And then also what practices would, sh would ensure it has a better chance of being used to improve your work and life. So um, we'll just leave, I guess I'll uh, leave this up here as we're continuing to answer questions. Um, and you can ask questions about this, put your ideas in the chat and we can share them out. But I think this is when people say, okay, how can I put this into action right away? just doing a little bit of work to think about it while it's on your mind and um, and put and come up with some of these things that you can then follow through with uh, in the next couple of weeks or so is, a, is okay. a really good way to get started. This is great practical application. So maybe if y'all can take a picture of the screen, um, if you have your cameras there so that you could um, have it at a later date. Um, so here's another question that's coming through here, Lighty, which is, is subtracting being generous or is it a philosophy of living with less? Uh, that's interesting. I I mean, I think it it can be a philosophy of living with less, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, and certainly some people like living with less or or feel that we should live with less, um, which is great. And I think, you know, I fall into that category in some areas. But I think it's also just another way to make change right just mm -hmm. as we try to add something to make things better you can subtract things to make better and it's a, a way to make change that we don't often use so yes there's this whole class of subtractions that involve living with less but some of them are you know not about that at all they're just about you know trying to make make things better and it mm -hmm. just happens to be that less is the way mm -hmm. Um, have you experienced the need for extreme subtraction where you subtract to the bare minimum and then add back? I oh, was actually listening to good. you. I know you are a fan of Adam Grant and he just did a podcast on meetings and somebody on the podcast was talking about they deleted everybody in the company deleted every recurring meeting that they had. And then there were like three criteria that they had criteria that they had in order to add the meetings back into the schedule. So just curious about it. Is it extreme subtraction where you subtract everything to a bare minimum and then add back? What would you suggest? That's funny. I'm going to be on that podcast. I, I wonder if it's coming up soon. So you got to tell me when you hear it, Tab. Oh um, my, are yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. I hope so. He, we, we recorded it. He better put it on there. But, um, so we, uh, but yeah, the meeting example is great because I think there are times when just subtracting everything can flip the whole calculus around, right? Because we've talked a lot about how hard it is to subtract. And what that massive subtraction does is kind of make that happen all at once, right? And then instead of thinking about each individual meeting and why you're going to subtract it or not subtract it, you're thinking about whether you should add them back. And it's a really mm -hmm. powerful way to flip around the, uh, the entire situation. So I think... Um, it's not the only way to do it, but it's certainly a really good way to do it is to do it drastically. And I was talking to this, actually another group of uh, UVA kind of business people last week, and they, they said something similar where that's like a sign that you've subtracted enough is that you're adding things back in, right? You, mm. <laughs> okay, I did. I went far enough because now <laughs> I realized I have to pull these things back in. And that's something... It's interesting because, you know, we often think, okay, I'm going to like pilot this new thing, which means I'm going to try this new thing. And if it doesn't work, I can just stop doing it. But you can also do that for subtracting, right? You can just stop mm -hmm. doing something. And if if it has disastrous consequences, then just add it back in. But we don't, mm -hmm. you know, we don't seem to take that approach as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does this work only, uh, th th I'm sorry, does this only work after a person has proven themselves? How does a novice in a field prove that less is more without looking unaccomplished? 
Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, I mean, that is. That's why we need to, um, you know, carve out permission for this to happen. But I think, you know, there are tricks to showing your work, right? So imagine a, a student that wants to hand in a haiku. If you're really uncertain that the teacher is not going to appreciate that you subtracted, you can also hand in the 12 drafts or, you know, all the work that you used to do, right? Um, so I think as you're as you're getting started, you can say, look, here are the, all the things that I thought of and I've whittled it down to the subtraction. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. effectively you're, mm -hmm. you're, whoever's evaluating it is going to look at the subtraction, but you've still got all the, the background stuff um, to show that you weren't just being lazy. That's right. That's right. So, so, and, and I guess what you're saying also was just sort of showing the work, right? Like showing yeah. the work that you've done to get to less is is an important part you just don't show up with less yeah exactly yeah um somebody asked if you are related to um mrs Klotz, who was the secretary to henry mortigal secretary of treasury for the entire fdr administration interesting um i'll have Fun to i don't think there. so no okay um no not that I know of. Not that you know of. I'll ask my um, dad. You can do the uh, genealogy, you know, the new things. The you can <laughs> see if you have the connected back to the F anybody in the FDR administration there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as a civil engineering professor, how would you change or improve the seller or doer model in the engineering consulting world where responsibilities and roles get added faster than you can delegate or subtract? What advice would you give your students to prepare them as they enter or advance in this industry and grow in life? Okay. Um, so I'm a trying couple to, parts there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is probably not something that a button that students can push right away, but I mean, I think, um, you know, kind of shifting our perspective from, you know, provider of products to provider of services is something that can help in engineering and many other fields, right? So instead of thinking of, okay, we're going to, this is a grand example, but, it, you know, instead of thinking we're going to build highways to, we're going to help people, you know, connect with people in this other community, right? And now all of a sudden, instead of just highways, you've got, you know, highways and video conferencing and, and all these other options. And I know that kind of takes it out of the realm of civil engineering, but I think that the point is to, to help with this shift from, you know, provider of products to provider of services. Cause fundamentally, you know, and you can think about it in terms of air conditioning, right? It's like, okay, mm -hmm. what, what do people want? They want to feel comfortable in the office. And if you can sell them comfort instead of air conditioning then all of a sudden you have multiple mm. options not just the you know sure you're gonna try to figure out what temperature to make the air but you can also think about you know dress codes and different furniture that it might could feel cooler or fans and breezes and so that's something you know that shift from products to services um i think you know in terms of getting overloaded in the office that's that's, I don't know. That's why I'm in academia. <laughs> so I did work. No, I don't know. I, I mean, I, it's just, it's hard, right? And I, you, the question was posed as like, as students go out into the real world and, you know, it's just, that's just the really, they don't have a lot of opportunity to change right. the whole system at that moment. They've got to kind of figure it out and get up into a position where they can make the change. It's not the time where they can say, well, let's, let's, do this whole thing differently um and, and so, it seems to me that maybe what you were talking about like good better less like as they start out in the field they have to add a little bit mm -hmm. so that until they get to the point where they can subtract and maybe it's not something that you can do right out of the gate necessarily in a professional setting that's true i mean i, I think that's also um we haven't talked too much about like learning and ideas but there you mm -hmm. know subtraction is really powerful there but it's the same thing you can't just come into an industry that yeah you've got a great uva education but you really don't know very much at all about how the industry works yet you've got to learn how that works before you can figure out the pieces of it that may not make sense it would be really overconfident to go into a an industry and say oh look at this thing that 
seems to not make sense to me before you kind of understood everything about it and and why it worked the way that it did. And then you could kind of recommend the subtraction. So yeah, I think there's a, you know, e there's a learning element to it um, mm -hmm. in addition to just like a gaining respect element to it. And then here's our last question before I turn it back over to Althea, which I think is interesting. Um, someone asks, is it easier for an introvert to subtract than an extrovert? Oh, interesting. This is why I love these things. That's mm -hmm. that question is never. I'm trying to think of the theories. Uh, I guess the person didn't add that. Uh, what the what their hypothesis would be. Um, the question was just, do you think there's a connection between personality type and willingness to add or subtract? In other words, is it easier yeah. for an introvert to subtract than an extrovert? Something that just occurred to this the um the guest as 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 she was reading the book. If it is easier for an intro introvert to subtract, which is her guess, why might that be? Okay. I guess the, she's, the signal in is that maybe an introvert would be more willing to subtract. More willing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's amazing. I'm an introvert, so I'll have to uh, do some stuff. You got to think about that. Uh -huh. I will. So the evidence that we have from our studies, there wasn't really any correlation. We didn't, you know, measure personality yeah. types, but there weren't correlations between ages and things. But the next phase of our research, we're really interested in looking at, you know, different, I mean, cultures is the way it's put colloquially, but, you know, cultures are so varied as well. So it's really like what kind of cultural tendencies um, might predict subtraction or make people more likely to subtract. So I would put the the introvert extrovert uh, scale on there and, and see. But I, I, I guess for now, I, I will go with uh, the hypothesis of the person who posed the question who's clearly thought about it more than I have. But um, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting and appropriate framing, because I think we're trying to figure out, you know, what you know, what would make people more likely to think about this or feel like they have mm -hmm. more permission to do these things? Mm -hmm. Well, I know we are at time now. And so I will turn it over to Althea. Um, thank you so much, Lighty, for expanding our minds, expanding our thinking. It, it This whole book was the rage in the spring when it, you know, hit the um, hit UVA by storm. And so we are still all metabolizing it and digesting it. So thank you so much for your time today. And um, you've given us a lot to think about and a lot to take away, pun intended. Um, pun intended, nice Althea, <laughs> I'll take it, turn it over to you. Oh my goodness, it was so great to listen in on your, your conversation. I learned so much. I'm sure the parents at home learned so much that little tidbits that they could uh, share with their students as well. So thank you, Lighty, and thank you, Tabitha, for moderating that conversation. You two together are great. Uh, we might have to create a little podcast <laughs> at UVA for you guys to, to talk like once a month, uh, get together and have a conversation. So that was great. So, so Lighty, subtraction may take more thought, but you end up with better results. Is that basically the nutshell of what you were saying today? Yeah, more thought, more effort. It might take more, but it's a whole nother kind of tool in your tool belt, right? So you can't go wrong if you uh, if you think about it. Well, thank you both. Thank you so very much. So thank you. Audience, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we look forward to you joining us at a future in-person or online webinar. Uh, please visit the Lifetime Learning website for details on future programs. Our thoughts on the Lawn blog, make sure you check those out. UVA Speaks, our podcast, and recorded lectures in our podcast library. Visit us at engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Stay well.